Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Today our topic of discussion is uh, related to heart So we have a couple of scenarios uh, First of all So there is a 35 year old man who presented to you with fever, cheer, smile, cheer, weakness and dyspnea And you have examined the patient and examined patient reveals that there is a temperature of 101 uh, Fahrenheit they are partaking on the abdomen and uh, also on uh, other body parts. The patient has some kind of murmur and there are skin lesions. So there is a secondly uh, scenario where 45 year old man who has presented to you with night sweats, there is anorexia, cough and rash on the body. And when you examine the patient, there are raised lanes and on the palms and fingers and there are bleeding spots under the nails and supplinomegaly. So, uh, any kind of scenario you may uh, face in your MRCS Part B and OSCE exam. So let's first of all overview these uh, uh, these scenarios. What is the examiner saying to you, and what is he suspecting? So he is giving you uh, symptoms: fever, there is chills, myalgia, and weakness. And then patient has some signs, temperature is 101, there are tachy on the abdomen and other parts, there is the murmur and skin lesions. So any, any, any time you see the patient is presenting to you with temperature, high temperature and along with murmur your first diagnosis should be infective endocarditis. In the second scenario he says he gives you some non-specific symptoms along with very specific things. He says they are night sweats related to patient is having some kind of temperature and anorexia, which is cachexic, which is a cough and rash. And then he says that there are some very important things, some raised lesions on the palm and fingers. It means the patient is having either oscillant nodules and Jane uh, Williams. So uh, these things, then uh, bleeding spots under the nails. It means patient having splinter hemorrhage and splenomegaly. So here, that all these uh, uh, collective signs and symptoms, these are related to infective endocarditis. So the, any of scenario you can get in your exam, be ready for that. So what is what is infective endocarditis? Endo, infective endocarditis is defined by three important things. Number one is uh, inflammation. Number one is inflammation. Number two is which which part of the heart uh, is inflamed? Endocardial lining, endocardial lining of the valves, or endocardial lining of the atrium and ventricle. So it is a question. So it is of the valves it is of the valves so endocardial lining the surface of the cardiac valves and it is caused by microorganisms if this inflammation is not caused by microorganism it's not called infective endocarditis it may be non bacterial uh, sle related non uh, endocardial or carcinoid related endocarditis we are just going through in the next slide so different types Infective, non-bacterial, thrombotic, endocarditis, Leibman sac endocarditis, and carcinoid syndrome related to carcinoid syndrome. So let's go through uh, infective endocarditis. Here, what will happen? Happen is that microbes they colonize the heart valves. So first of all, for example, the heart valve is damaged or uh, the patient has prosthetic heart valve. There will be clots of fibrin and platelets so, so there will come fibrin there will come platelets and then along them and then on them there will be colonization of these microbes these microbes will come and then they will infect and they will uh, form vegetation so this is the pathophysiology whenever the heart is uh, uh, heart valve is uh, damaged or prosthetic valve there will come fibrin and uh, platelets they will form their clots on them there will this will be a night dish for bacteria bacteria will come and they form vegetations and two types of infective endocarditis you know this there's acute endocarditis and subacute endocarditis that is not that dangerous and then they are uh, identified by via duke's criteria so we will we'll discuss this duke criteria subacute acute and details some more details then there comes some other form that is known as non-bacterial uh, thrombotic endocarditis. Non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis which is also known as marantic carditis. Which is also known as marantic carditis. So what is this carditis? First of all it is non-infective. 
first of all it is non infective it happens in some kind of diseases for example if the patient is having some adenocarcinoma or the patient is having some hypercoagulable state so in these conditions there is marantic uh, and this marantic carditis here vegetations will form along the line of closure of the this is very important along the line of closure of mitral valves and the patient will get mitral regurgitation and in comparison to that there is an other form which is called as lipman sac endocarditis which is called lipman sac endocarditis which is related to one important thing sla it means it is immune related it is immune related it means it is immune related and this can happen to both mitral as well as uh, tricuspid but in this there are small vegetations not large vegetation there are small vegetations and these are not along the line of closure these are not along the line of closure these are on the upper surface and the lower surface so one is related to immunity it is related to immune related other one is related to adenocarcinoma and hypercoagulable state that is why we call it thrombotic endocarditis and then there is a fourth form which is called as which is called as related to carcinoid syndrome the carcinoid syndrome there are certain hormones and enzymes which are released for example there is serotonin bradykinin uh, and other things so they will come they will go into the circulation and from circulation they go into the right heart so they will affect right heart not left heart why not left heart because these are detoxified in the lungs these are detoxified in the lungs so uh, whenever they will pass in the lungs they will detoxify and then they will go into the uh, left heart so that is where right heart is uh, affected as compared to the uh, left hand uh, left heart and they will form endocardial plaques then will, will form endocardial plaques so that is how there are four different types uh, of endocarditis and they are differentiated from uh, one another but we our main focus is this one infective endocarditis this may be cause microorganism for example bacteria fungi so there are different organisms that, that are uh, causing uh, infective endocarditis so here you can see there are small vegetations in rheumatic heart disease and the patient with rheumatic heart disease there are small and you can see them and then you can see that uh, there are somehow different this one uh, large infective endocarditis uh, some small and some large different type of endocarditis not only one in the well but also the uh, cord tendony then there is uh, one important difference between you can see nbt and lse and non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis and uh, related to uh, lipman sac endocarditis you can see here valves upper surface and lower surface upper and lower both are sides of uh, the valve are involved but here you can see that only the line of closure is involved in this uh, uh, non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis so this is the basic difference between all these uh, types of endocarditis next is that why rheumatic heart valve and replaced valve uh, uh, replaced valve these are main focus and susceptible to the endocarditis and here i will say that whenever there is anything damaged whenever there is anything damaged and for example this is damaged so if you, a water has to flow or blood has to flow that that will be a turbulent flow that will be a turbulent flow and not the stream flow not the stream flow so whenever there are turbulent flow flow will be slow flow will be slow and bacteria will be having a chance to colonization for chance for colonization so turbulent flow slow flow uh, and irregular flow bacteria will come and then they will colonization of these bacteria on those valves and uh, then they will call the why this is why that these valves uh, replaced valves and rheumatic heart valves damaged valves these are the main focus and susceptible to endocarditis infective endocarditis then comes what is the pathophysiology so what is the pathophysiology of endocarditis so there is one thing that is coming inside the body and that is very important that is very important we call it as m protein m protein is the antigen it will work as an antigen will come into the body whenever the antigen comes into the body so uh, 
a human host immune system will activate and two important things antibodies and cd4 positive t cells so t4 positive and these m proteins antigen antibody will be activated antibodies will be activated against the antigen so what will happen they will recognize the antigen as well as they will recognize one important and other thing uh, as an antigen as that is uh, cardiac self antigen cardiac self antigen so these antibodies will react against m proteins and cardiac self antigen so antigen antibody complex will form this complex when it is formed it will complement uh, it will activate the complement system and you know whenever the complement system is activated it will call for the, all the policemen all the policemen to rescue them or for it will include the neutrophils cytokines macrophages so these are these are the important so remember these three names in your mind and back of mind because this will have very important uh, uh, manifestations later on so neutrophils cytokines macrophages uh, lymphocytes all these will be activated come to rescue the heart uh, but it will be against its own uh, antigen will be self antigen there will not be anti any other antigen so what will happen now you know there is a cascade uh, of uh, events after this acute inflammation that is known as chronic inflammation so what will happen there will be you know recurrent inflammation then after recurrent inflammation there will be fibrosis 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 will lead to narrowing narrowing because you, you, you know that if there are two wells and there is something happening here something uh, happening here so if though both on the inside is something happening so this pathway will be narrowed down so th that is of after fibrosis there will narrow down narrowing down and you know in fibrosis there are some fibroblast the fibroblasts there are some fibroblasts so make them stiff make them stiff and then there will be obviously when they are stiff they cannot uh, much movement and then cannot move to, so there will be difficulty in their closure there will be difficulty in closure and uh, there will be uh, commercial fuel they will come out uh, they will just fuse with themselves but they not there will be difficult in movement and then retraction of the leaflet edges and well thickening and you know and then there will become some kind of calcification so all these things will lead to stenosis and some kind of regurgitation also so there will be uh, it will be basically iron uh, a chronic inflammation chronic inflammation recurrent inflammation fibrosis thickening stenosis calcification all these cascade you should uh, remind these things because uh, these will happen again come again and again in your R course next is gross findings what are gross finding i told you chronic acute phase and chronic phase uh, so there are two different things uh, so in acute phase you can see that these there are these kind of vegetation you can see here so these are vegetation they will come in acute phase then well vegetation these will be along the line of closure on the upper surface lower surface but in infective endocarditis along the line of closure then comes the chronic phase in chronic phase there will be i told you already although there's cascade of events will happen what uh, recurrent inflammation then fibrosis then thickening then calcification then this will be short fused cardiac tendinai and this face shape is called fish mouth shape it's not important to memorize but you should know that it is called fish mouth uh, uh, fish mouth uh, uh, shape of the wells that will uh, form then what is the mac microscopic finding after the mic macroscopic findings what is the microscopic finding so there is two important things one number one is a show of body and number two is anishka cells so this just have a look i asked you that remember some important cells neutrophils macrophages fibroblasts and uh, uh, some other have plasma and so here you can see this is the show of body this is a show of body and i can show you here you can see there is central and this central is necrosis so what is a show of body a show of body is central zone of necrosis and this is just surrounded by this type of you can see these type of uh, different type of cells neutrophils macrophages fibroblasts plasmacytes and uh, so these uh, plasma cells so these are called uh, and uh, macrophages so these are called ash of bodies one important thing is uh, we have used the term here 
of anisco cells anisco cells what are these anisco cells basically these are macrophages lekin but these are macrophages are not simple macrophages they are somehow called activated macrophages activated macrophages so these are activated macrophages bundle of cytoplasm but there is plenty of cytoplasm indeed inside them and their nucleus have specific shape known as wavy nuclear outline we call it as wavy nuclear outline they have wavy nuclear outline and it is found in not only endocardium but pericardium as well as in the myocardium so th this is called anisco cells so let's uh, have uh, we can see them here these are called anisco cells they are found in rheumatic heart disease all three layers activated macrophages the other name is either uh, or i like nucleus or they are caterpillar like nucleus they have caterpillar like nucleus this is called wav uh, pattern nucleus so it, you can see here the nucleus this one is the nucleus then bundle of cytoplasm this one and then this is the caterpillar and if you see it in uh, cross section they look like oval so this is a different type of anisco cells activated macrophages then what the number of investigations you will go and you know there are number or should be number of investigation not only one or two investigations you have to go for for uh, what investigation you will do if the patient comes to you with fever or if the patient comes to you with the uh, fever high grade fever then the patient is having anorexia murmur and uh, also this patient is sweating so first implication was so obviously go for fbc to uh, see the number of uh, neutrophils leukocytes and uh, lymphocytes all these things so you go and along with that you could go for esr and crp so and you may also go for uh, urea uh, and uh, electrolyte and urine complete so you can go for that uh this is the general investigation but if the patient is having murmur and supplementary enlargement and abdomen is otherwise uh, fine and pretty and uh, supplementary hemorrhages and chain valleys and os uh, and os nodules and the patient is having some other kind of risk factor related to that for example i would try to use a prosthetic valve so obviously you will uh, you will click in your it will click in your mind that the patient may have got endo infective endocarditis and background of that you will ask for okay mr go for ecg and uh, i this patient is having high grade temperature so i may i need its blood culture and you will say that not only blood culture and ecg i also need echo patient is having fever along with murmur so i will go for that and then you will say that i also need some kind of uh, titer antibodies titer antibodies titer so yes, go for serum analysis also so the serology so do you will go for these number of investigations in uh, that patient not only go for 2d echo directly and uh, uh, try to diagnose the patient and then uh, there is if there is 2d echo what are you going to watch in 2d echo so there is i have shown you a picture of a heart and you can see here in this picture of heart and you can see a uh, different types of uh, uh, here uh, structures for example i will start with uh, this you can see cardiac tendony and then leaflets uh, leaflets then these uh, valves valves and then you can see here inside the valve there may be some valve sub valvular apparatus then this is the heart valve of the ventricle valve of the ventricle and then around that there obviously there is will be pericardium so these are almost four five to six things you are just watching on the cross in this heart so these are the different things you have to watch in your echocardiography in 2d echocardiogram you know here transthoracic echocardiography is not that much accurate but 2d echo, uh, that is much accurate so what you do you will see is if there is a cord tendon uh, rupture of the cord tendon rupture or there is elongation of that then you see if the valves uh, how much blood flow what is the speed of the blood flow that is passing through these valves and uh, what is the velocity of that blood uh, that is passing through that and what is the regurgitation of the if there it is more than 1 cm of flow obviously it will be significant and uh, then you will see that okay these are the leaflets and uh, i want to see inside the leaflets uh, sub valvular apparatus you, you have to 
uh, check for valuer uh, operators, sub valuer operators. Then you will see if there there is something uh, wrong going with the with the wall of the uh, ventricle of the um, of that heart, and then epic cardiac and pericardial pericardial effusion. So these are the four, five to six things. So I will just enumerate them again. As you has so look for cardi tendony, leaflet, uh, valves, sub valvular apparatus and uh, then ventricles and uh, pericardial effusion so you will look for all these things and i have just mentioned these things here are regurgitation jet more than one centimeter and velocity of 2.5 centimeter uh, meter per second that's important and then prolapse uh, and thickening of the valves leaflet thickening if they, this is more than four centimeter that is obviously very significant and then you have to go for uh, uh, cardiac annular dilatation annular dilatation is more if there is more uh, increased and it means it's just because of re regurgitation then you have to look for cardia, you know, elongation rupture, subvalue operators, pericardiofian, and ventricular dilatation and disc function, which is usually due to regurgitation. I have told already. And then there are common organisms. So there are set of organisms which are very important and that are, which are specific for uh, uh, for um, this. Uh, uh, for this infective endocarditis, as we know that E. coli is specific for, we, we usually call it for the gut infection or we call it for sanguinary tract infection, but not Staphylococcus. The Staphylococcus is that specific here. Uh, there are a set, set, uh, set of organisms which are important. So, which are those organisms? Uh, let's go one by one. Viridans streptococci. So, first of all, remember this name. So that, that towards the end you should memorize these names. Then Staphylococcus. So Viridans streptococci. Staphylococcus. Coagulase negative Staphylococcus and Therococci. So these four organisms are important. First of all, Viridans Staphylococcus aureus, uh, Coagulase negative, and Enterococci. Then there are a couple of organisms which are known as uh, related to oropharyngeal membrane. Oropharyngeal membrane. So these are oropharyngeal membrane has a group of organisms: Haemophilus, Influenza, and Agritobacter, and uh, similarly. Uh, cardiobacterium and echinella and congella i um, remember their name by very by very funny names so i cannot remember uh, just call them here so <clears throat> These are the organisms uh, uh, you should know. First of all, their names should be known. And then what's the most common organism that is causing this uh, infective endocarditis? That is viridans streptococci. I, that is why I have mentioned at the top. So viridans streptococci. But it is very um, it, it is a good organism because it is not that its virulence is very low. It's not that, uh, that virulent as Staphylococcus aureus. It will act only on those uh, viles which are already damaged or a patient is already diseased our heart disease related to heart disease so it will uh, act on them but and it will cause subacute endocarditis subacute endocarditis it will not cause uh, acute endocarditis it will cause subacute endocarditis but by comparison to the staphylococcus it is uh, mm, not a good organism for the heart it is uh, it acts on normal tricuspid valve it will act on normal tricuspid well its virulence is very high in the blood whenever it gets into the blood and then it is related to IV drug abuser. So IV drug abuser you are just injecting your uh, staphylococcus into the bloodstream it will go obviously through the veins first to the right heart if that is why if right heart uh, uh, if there was someone is uh, try, uh, is IV drug abuser, there are high chances the patient is having uh, his uh, uh, infective endocarditis related to uh, tricuspid valve, not uh, related to uh, metal valve. And uh, patient will get acute endocarditis, not uh, subacute endocarditis. And then comes coagulase negative. Yeah, they are not uh, that bad organisms for uh, heart, but this enterococci. So remember these three names: uh, uh, viridans, staphylococcus, and enterococci. If these three organisms are found in the uh, culture of these uh, patients, then the patients are uh, candidates for surgery. These are candidates for surgery either with uh, uh, health valve replacement or with the native valve. So these organisms come in, then they uh, should go for surgery. Then the highest group of organisms I have already mentioned and don't be worried about that. Okay. Then what are different uh, uh, diagnostic criteria? The diagnostic criteria are uh, 
so uh, then there comes the duke scribe what how would you mention the label the patient that this patient has caught has uh, uh, catched uh, caught uh, uh, this uh, infective endocarditis how would you label that this for this we have modified duke's criteria we have this modified duke's criteria and this modified duke's criteria is uh, very important and here you can either be two major or one major and two minor and either no major and five minor so there are uh, different criteria as i have mentioned it with a capital m and small m so either two major zero either one major and two and here if zero here should be five so almost there should be five for example if you one major is equal to two minor two into two is equal to four almost five two uh, here two minor and one major so two plus two is equal to four and here five criteria so it should be four at least so if there are so the major criteria and minor criteria and now let's see what are major criteria and what are minor criteria so i mentioned previously that uh, there are two sets of investigation this is very important for uh, to diagnose the patient as uh, uh, um, as infective endocarditis one is uh, in, uh, is uh, blood culture and other one is echocardiography First of all, we see what are, should be the findings on blood culture and on blood culture, if your patient is having typical microorganisms, those mentioned previously, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Viridens, Staphylococcus aureus, Enterococci and uh, has a group of organisms. Uh, so if and Staphylococcus, uh, 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 negative, Coagulus is negative, Staphylococci, Staphylococcus. So if this group of organisms, which are typical for this uh, infective endocarditis, they come in the blood and two separate blood cultures, not only one blood culture. On one blood culture, there should be coxilla burnetii. For two, there should be these two organisms to separate at least 24 hours. Then we call them as it is a positive one criteria. Then if there is more than 12 hours apart and they are consistently positive they are consistently positive then it means the patient is having uh, uh, this uh, in those organisms are related to uh, related to infective endocarditis and towards the end if the patient is having igg antibody titer and that is more than 1 by 800 on serology then the patient is uh, denoted as having uh, infective endocarditis so these are different four uh, criteria to uh, on blood culture or serology. Next one is on echocardiography. So in on echocardiography, it is very simple to remember. If the patient is having uh, some kind of abscess or there is new partial dehiscence of prostatic well, new valvular regurgitation, not old one. If there is old regurgitation and it has been worsened, it is not uh, uh, it does not fulfill the major criteria. If similarly, if the patient is having already de dehiscence uh, of the prostate wall it does not uh, fulfill the criteria but if the patient is having abscess new partial dehiscence of prostate wall new valvular regurgitation regurgitation then it fulfills the criteria on uh, on uh, eco echocardiography uh, similarly if the patient has a pre-existing murmur and now it has worsened it is not criteria for uh, uh, for uh, infective endocarditis so there are some minor criteria basically there are four minor criteria but we have enlisted these six here because these are the demands there are, what are these four uh, criteria number one is predisposition for example if the patient is having uh, mitral uh, damaged mitral, uh, uh, mitral valve damaged tricuspid valve if the patient is iv drug abuser if the, there is prostatic valve uh, if the patient is having a rheumatic heart disease so there is already a focus a suspect suspicion uh, that the patient will make get this infective endocarditis number one number second is a patient is having a fever and that fever is more than 38 degrees centigrade then the patient is uh, uh, it is a, one of the minor criteria similarly then there are two important phenomena number one is vascular phenomena and immunological phenomena there are two important uh, separate lesions related to that one is we i will call him jvp one is called jvp i i call it as jvp and the other one is i call opi opi you have to remember them jvp and opi what is jvp so here is genuine lesion 
that is related to vascular phenomena so jvp jvp and then there is oscillar nodule that is related to immunological phenomena opi why i call it put p first because p for painful p for painful so oscillar nodule is painful and that is related to immunological phenomena but genuilian is vascular and that is painless so this is the there is, uh, is a difference between these two uh, basic difference so sim similarly immunological there will be glomerulonephritis there will be roth spot roth you know in the eyes uh, you can uh, get some spots in the retina and then rheumatoid factor and then there comes some microbiological evidence uh, th those diff those evidences which are uh, not fulfilled into major criteria will not fit into the major criteria of on the microbiology and echo cord for example you have microbiological findings patient have fever and you get its uh, culture it comes e coli so e coli is not uh, organism that is found in the that fits in the major criteria so it is a minor criteria similarly to, you have some findings in on echo cord for example your tendon rupture tendon rupture is not uh, a major criteria so it will be a, it will fit into minor criteria but they, they, there is an abnormality so there is an abnormality on echo and microbiology but this is not fits into the major criteria we call it as minor criteria but there is abnormality so if there is uh, there are some uh, uh, kind of these kind of findings then we can have modified di di criteria and that fits into the and uh, to diagnose endocarditis then there are risk factors all plan uh, a long list of risk factors but you don't uh, need to remember all of this for the exam purposes you should remember just just uh, these seven eight to eight uh, different types of uh, risk factors iv drug abuser you know this is called by staphylococcus aureus and right heart failure and tricuspid valve uh, then there is a uh, vhd valvular heart disease already valvular heart disease this is a focus for some time of some type of infection similarly valvular replacement rheumatic heart disease all these are already damaged valves so damaged valves hiv decreased immunity that is list similarly for the malignancy for example i i, I didn't know carcinoma and tooth extraction for the tooth extraction you know tooth extraction that is uh, frequently being done by the quacks and this quack can inject some kind of uh, uh, this organism into your tooth and your bloodstream and then uh, can go for uh, go into the heart and cause um, this endocarditis so these are the seven different uh, risk factors important and very uh, commonly asked then there are complications though related to complications are related to uh, cardiac complications as well as non cardiac complications for what are the cardiac complications related to infective heart infective endocarditis so first of all related to uh, embolus so if there is embolus this embolus can go and can block anything any vessel so there are four important vessels they can embol this embolism can block for example if it forms the heart vessels acute myocardial infarction similarly it can cause uh, other which are non cardiac other are non cardiac i will just mention those uh, these are non cardiac in, uh, one and for example can cause stroke this stroke can be caused by it and similarly it can cause splenic abscess or splenic infarction and mesenteric ischemia so this embolus can cause two types of cardiac and as well as non-cardiac and then comes this infection can go from the endocardium to the pericard pericardium pericard it can cause pericarditis and if it affects your uh, heart's uh, uh, nervous system then it can cause the arrhythmia arrhythmia of the heart so uh, these are the complications just related to infective endocarditis and if there is patient obviously will get stenosis or regurgitation if any one of these patient get then the, this patient might get uh, CCF and if there is annular dilatation ventricular dilatation the patient can get aneurysm so these are different uh, types of cardiac complication and now the 
non cardiac complications are for example stroke splenic abscess infarction mesenteric ischemia already mentioned related to embolism and then immune related are glomerulonephritis and acute kidney injury so these are the important investigations you should know about the cardiac and non cardiac uh, non cardiac complications related to uh infective endocarditis then there are signs and symptoms so some of the time these are mixed sometimes you can uh, uh, just mention them separately for example no fever it is also sign as well as symptom more than 38 degrees centigrade you know it's important then uh, gene variants already mentioned and oscillant nodule mentioned rot spot these are already mentioned so rot spot oscillant nodule painful raised immune related and gene variants these are not painful these are painless i again repeat jvp and opi instead of epi epi is a that program run by who for uh, infection related disease for the uh, community related diseases so opi o for oscillant nodule p for painful i for immune related j for gene variants vascular and then these are painless so painless and uh, so this is uh, gene variants these are uh, found on the toes uh, plantar surface of the toes and uh, thinar hypothenar palm uh, these are uh, found there then there are simpliter hemorrhages these are blood clots under the nails but the important is if they are found on the uh, in the proximal part of the nails not on the on the uh, distal part if they are distal part it means they are these are normal anemia why the patient is uh, having anemia or this patient of uh, uh, this patient uh, related to uh, related to infective endocarditis because there is damage valve you know damage valve or there is infective endocarditis so whenever blood from uh, them will pass it will cause uh, it, there will be some kind of hemolysis and uh, so that is why the patient will get uh, uh, anemia and then this these blood uh, fragments they will go into the spleen so they will go into the spleen and uh, there will be uh, some kind of splenomegaly also so that is how uh, this pathophysiology fits into anemia and splenomegaly similarly there is embolism you know that why embolism will form small uh, type of clots and they will can go and block anything these are some kind of gene variants you can see them here and uh, you can spot them these are the gene variants these are the gene variants these gene variants these are also gene variants so there are small uh, macule and papules on the but there are some raised nodules and painful you know opi opi these are uh, these are oscillant nodules these are but these are mostly found on the fingers <clears throat> And next, what's the treatment? So treatment is very important because you have to uh, diagnose it early and then to, later on you have to uh, start its treatment. So uh, one, one thing is important, don't go for oral antibiotics. You have to go for IV antibiotics, number one. And what IV antibiotic it should be? What IV antibiotic should be? It should be either ceftriaxone or aminoglycoside or vancomycin why this uh, these combination why not a single for example we can go tesobactam we go for that why not because uh, you know that uh, these microorganisms these uh, contain also cell walls and uh, in that there is nucleus and they are very somehow very resistant you know um, uh, staphylococcus aureus is very resistant even we have an uh, to MRSA so they are very uh, resistant microorganisms so that is why we need a combination one septagon it will come and it will break this cell wall it will break its cell wall and it will break its cell wall and other one uh, this amino glycoside they will come up in uh, this breached cell wall and they will go into the cell uh, nucleus and then into the nucleus they will cause uh, lysis of that bacteria and they will kill that bacteria so that is like combination IV and that too for at least six weeks for at least six weeks is important and then why the patient gets a resistance to that why there is failure so there are uh, um, there are many causes of failure or causes of resistance so let's go uh, by them uh, one by one first is 
the patient is not getting appropriate antibiotic if the so enlist in your book that if the patient is not getting appropriate antibiotic second is if the patient is getting appropriate antibiotic but he is already resistant to that antibiotic so this these are two important causes that the patient is getting uh, this uh, uh, resistance from the uh, resistance uh, and treatment failure so these are two causes one uh, and next is if the patient is why how would you uh, come to know that patient is having a, a resistant not resolved uh, one is obviously blood culture you get blood culture and it is positive but if the patient is having persistent fever you will get an idea that okay my treatment is going to be failed and then you will go for blood uh, culture again then wells they are not uh, having specific blood so separate blood supply supplied uh, blood supply is sufficient and restricted so blood supply is sufficient so antibiotics may not reach up to the microorganisms and these microorganisms also found under the vegetation inside the vegetations so antibiotics uh, are have very difficulty to reach into the uh, into the um, microorganisms so these are th uh, three different causes and then those bacteria they have also a uh, limited number of nutrients available to them in uh, specifically in that location so this is important if there is a limited number of uh, uh, nutrition limited nutrition then it means that it will be a uh, limited uh, uh, there will be limited cell division and most of the antibiotics work on the uh, bacteria when they are they when the bacteria are dividing so that is why there may be some kind of uh, problem in that uh, enriching the bacteria and acting on them then bacteria form a protective biofilm a glycocalyx uh, cover around them and that shield them from antibiotics so these are different four to five causes uh, for antibiotic resistance or treatment failure then there come specific conditions what are the specific conditions you can maybe you ask in your exam for example they ask you a patient is having tricuspid valve uh, abnormality or there is problem with the uh, tricuspid valve so the patient will be having most probably iv drug abuse or pack uh, in the history and right heart failure can be the complication Similarly, if the patient is going for a, a heart transplantation, what type of matching you require? So if you need HLA and ABO type of, uh, uh, ABO type of uh, matching and if not done, the patient may get type 1 graft rejection. So what will you do to prevent that uh, graft reaction? You will go for mycophenolate, uh, tricholemus, tricholemus, uh, tricholemus and steroids. So tricholemus, mycophenolate and steroids. So these are three different types of drugs you will use. But remember, you should know that what are the side effects of these uh, antibiotics, of, of these uh, three important drugs. And also the antibiotics, because if you are going for long term, you may get uh, uh, some important complications related to them. And uh, also these uh, steroids. So what are steroids? So steroids are going into the body and they are causing your immunity to be low so first of all there will be opportunistic infections bacterial viral and as well as fungal infections so you know that if your person fun is using your oral thrush again and again and some other important infections similarly the patient will having some cushionoid habits uh, there will, will be fatty obesity fresh especially the truncal obesity and uh, then trunkal obesity and muscle weakness hirsutism triacid these are all complications related to that then you know there are some cardiovascular there will be fluid retention hypertension when there is fluid retention hypertension and you will go toward the ccf and then you know the glucocorticoid they causes uh, your uh, uh, increase in glucose and uh, increase in gluco uh, insulin resistance so that's why there will be diabetes mellitus and musculoskeletal related to osteoporosis avian proximal myopathy all these things will happen to that patient if he is using steroids for long term next is uh, different types of these uh, uh, and uh, these uh, medicine immune modulators uh, and uh, to decrease the immunity of the patient with uh, uh, some kind of replacement they are used for example they are used steroid we use the corticosteroid drugs cytotoxic drugs immunofelins and lymphocyte depleting therapies so remember their mechanism of action is uh, usually asked remember in mechanism of action in a 
with the exception of cytotoxic drugs cytotoxic drugs which causes blocks the cell division non specifically which blocks the cell division all the other three drugs they are causing uh, they are just killing t cells they are killing t cells they are killing t cells so it is very easy to remember that in cytotoxic t drugs cytotoxic drugs they cause the uh, block the cell division while other three immunofluorescence corticosteroids lymphocyte depleting drugs these are all just uh, uh, causing the t cells to uh, kill just killing t cells so next is uh, uh, that how this you can see here steroids you can see this steroid causes macrophages problem with macrophages and so natural killer cells just blocking uh, immunoleukin uh, uh, 2 and uh, then they are causing uh, these b cells and t cells so they are ca just causing different types of uh, uh, functions to just to decrease the immunity and uh, inflammation inside the body then you know cytotoxic drugs very important their mechanism of action one example of cytotoxic drugs you know is methotrexate this methotrexate so methotrexate this is a dihydroflurotrexate inhibitor they will come uh, and act on the uh, folate uh, folate re receptors and inside the nucleus they will just uh, deplete the dna and protein synthesis and so cell proliferation will be blocked so that is how this methotrexate is working and similarly this uh, other um, uh, monoclonal antibodies are working uh, for example uh, there uh, there is uh, one kind of monoclonal uh, antibody cetuximab so this cetuximab how is working this cetuximab cetuximab will come if it will uh, end on end of ethylene growth factor receptor here and uh, after binding to that it will come inside the body and then it will again cell proliferation decrease the cell proliferation increase the apoptosis and decrease the angiogenesis you know this angiogenesis is very important for inflammation as well as metastasis and malignancy uh, to proceed forward so that is why how these are acting on the body so cetuximab acts on the egf receptors and inhibit the auto uh, phosphorylation of tyrosine kinase inhibitor so it is uh, you know cetuximab is tyrosine kinase inhibitor basically next is cyclosporin so cyclosporin this will also come inside the body it will bind with the cyclophilin here with the cyclophilin uh, sorry it will bind here with the cyclophilin and then it will uh, just block the calcineurin this calcineurin is uh, very important for nuclear uh, proliferation and that is how it will cause the uh, inhibit and kill the t-cells and then warfarin uh, this patient you know they are going if uh, for a heart uh, any kind of surgery heart replacement surgery or uh, um, uh, for the valve replacement surgery so what uh, 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 is the um, medicine you are going to patient to prescribe the patient for lifelong or long term of uh, time so that is uh, warfarin so this warfarin will be uh, very important is because it will just uh, 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 just uh, uh, prevent your patient from developing some kind of uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction or some time of stroke stroke so it is given that is why it's given a uh, lifelong mechanism of action you know it inhibits so vitamin k dependent uh, factors 279 and 10 and 279 and 10 so these are factors it vitamin k dependent factors it will uh, act on the viper, vitamin k epoxide and inhibit that enzyme vitamin oxide reductase so that is how it vitamin k will not be activated and uh, so that is uh, its uh, uh, factors will not uh, be turned on and the patient will not having coagulation monitoring is done uh, through pt and inr i international normalized ratio and reversal is done with the uh, type of uh, uh, reversal it is done with three types number one is ffp number two is uh, vitamin k and number three is uh, uh, pcc pcc prothrombin complex uh, concentrate so uh, you, vitamin k is uh, given in opd basis on opd basis but these two white uh, ffp and uh, pcc they are given on the 
emergency basis on emergency basis er basis so these are very important and pcc you know you give it when uh, the patient is emergency uh, it is preferred over ffp because uh, in uh, when you give ffp to the patient there will be fluid overload so that is why it is uh, important that uh, pcc should be available to the patient pathway which pathway you know uh, extrinsic or intrinsic pathway you know and extrinsic pathway is important for uh, warfarin then comes what are the proflex against antibiotics uh, in, against infective endocarditis remember there is not recommended any proflex antibiotics against infective endocarditis but if your patient is already a risk factor having a risk factor for example tooth extraction those refer that we have already uh, mentioned iv drug abuser or the patient is having uh, as some prosthetic wear and that patient is getting some kind of fever or some other symptom related to related to infective endocarditis but it's not fulfilling major criteria and minor criteria and modified dukes criteria and uh, for uh, the diagnosis of uh, uh, infective endocarditis but the patient is having a risk factor along with that has having fever so you have to go for and to give the patient antibiotics here you will give a set of antibiotics which are uh, which are also effective against infective endocarditis so that you may prevent that you are not going to give prophylaxis Uh, if the patient is not having any other indication for uh, uh, antibiotic usage but if the patient is having some symptom like that then you should give antibiotics for other cause that are also effective against infective endocarditis so it is so simple but you are not going to for uh, going to uh, do for uh, chlorhexidine mouthwash or some other prevention for uh, infective endocarditis what are different indication for surgery in prosthetic wall these are very important not mentioned anywhere else so i have mentioned here so what are these indications so there is two different things one number one is if the patient is having prosthetic wall and number two is if the patient is having native wall number two is if the patient is having native wall so first of all we will go for uh, this prosthetic wall so if the patient is having mechanical prosthetic prosthesis so you have to ha- go for surgery 100% you have to go for 100 sorry 100 you have to remove that prosthesis because that will be the cause of that infective endocarditis but if the patient is having bioprosthesis then you uh, there are some indications that the patient should go for uh, uh, for for uh, surgery or not so i also already mentioned one Staphylococcus aureus, epidermidis, and enterococcus, and along with that fungus. So these four organisms you should go for surgery. You should go for surgery. Similarly, if there are some uh, symptoms of embolism, you should go for surgery. So, antibiotic. So if you are giving patient uh, prescribing antibiotic for one week, but their symptoms are not uh, uh, settled yet, and the patient has a positive uh, blood culture, and their patient is also having fever, so you you, you should go for uh, think of surgery related to that. And if the patient is having new well paravalvular regurgitation during this treatment. fistula is there or there is some kind of abscess then you should go for surgery so there are bioprosthesis there are different type of these four indications that your patient your patient should go for uh, surgery and no but if the patient is having native wall so when then you have almost same uh, indication for surgery for example here you can a uh, culture positive culture same indication for same after seven days of treatment uh, your symptoms are not settled and uh, fever is same and you uh, go for the culture and uh, culture is again positive you go should go for surgery specific organisms those all those organisms staph aureus uh, and viridens streptococcus and uh, enterobacter and fungus and same abscess fistula and heart block and uh, then there is one important thing that is not uh, in the criteria for the that's not in the criteria for uh, uh, prosthetic wall that is left heart failure from regurgitation so if there is left heart failure from regurgitation then you have to go for uh, surgery even the patient is having a wall so that is how you treat you prevent uh, this uh, infective endocarditis patient and uh, i hope that it will cover all the um, uh, important questions you will come across in your um, mrcs part b oski exam and uh, keep watching our videos and we will 
try you updated uh, we will uh, keep you updated with our videos of uh, mrcs part b exam so thank you so much for watching our video